Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, Dr. Langston received his MD at McGovern Medical School at UT Houston Health Science Center. He completed his pediatrics residency, neonatal perinatal medicine fellowship, and medical education fellowship at UCLA, and subsequently joined our faculty here in 2020. His academic interests include teaching of trainees as well as health equity, in which he serves as the Department of Pediatrics co-chair on the Committee of Health Disparities. Uh, Dr. Hallian attended uh, UC Davis School of Medicine with the Regent Scholarship. She went on to complete her pediatrics residency at New York Presbyterian Wall Cornell Medical Center, followed by the Neonatal Perinatal Fellowship at UCLA. She joined the faculty at uh, Cedars here in 2020 and holds dual appointments as assistant professor both here and UCLA. She's actively involved in trainee education, quality improvement, and antenatal counseling. She is the lead physician for high-risk outpatient consults and a firm believer that care of the complex newborn begins before birth with antenatal counseling. Thank you for being here today. Uh, you can go ahead and share your slides now. Perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction, and uh, thank you to really Dr. Kilpatrick and Dr. Ozimek for allowing us to speak with you all today. Can you see our slides? Yes, we can see your okay. slide. So today's Grand Rounds, we've really titled a discussion regarding <clears throat> extreme prematurity because it's such a trending topic, if you will, in the field of neonatology. And we want to look at the outcomes and a general approach to consultation. So generally, it's always nice to think about a case. And this one specifically happened with me maybe about seven years ago. And we have a 38-year-old mother at who's G1P0, who presents with cervical insufficiency and cervical dilatation at 21 weeks and six days. The MFM team at the time did monitor to do a rescue cerclage, but this was um, you know, decided not to do due to prolapsing membranes. Of course, her pregnancy progresses to 22 and zero. Family planning was consulted, and the general discussions were an induction of labor versus a D and E. Uh, 22 and 1, Nikki was consulted, and MFM and mom had already sort of agreed to not pursue resuscitation or antenatal steroids until 23 weeks and zero days. And Nikki generally agreed with this, and the general plan was to pursue comfort care on delivery. Now, she continues to progress. Fetus is looking well on the monitors, and at 22 and 5, for a possible delivery at 23 and 0, the team decides, let's go ahead and start betamethasone, but we're still not going to offer resuscitation until the baby is at least 23 weeks and zero days. Now, she unfortunately does begin having preterm contractions the next day at 22 weeks and six days. And now mom is really pushing for resuscitation. NICU is reconsulted. They agree to resuscitate the baby and MFM decides to start magnesium and administers the second dose of betamethasone approximately 24 hours before delivery. Now, the fetus is footling breach, breach and the, the mom really advocated for a C-section, even though this was initially not offered, but ultimately was performed. <clears throat> the baby was born at 22 weeks and six days with a birth weight of 440 grams, about the 11th percentile with APGARs of 0, 4, 5, and 7. So questions that really arose from this case was whose responsibility is it to declare viability? What makes a provider determine viability? How do you decide to resuscitate versus provide comfort care? And how do you counsel this mom and family? And these questions are so important to sit down and reflect on because if you turn on the news, you might see articles like this. Babies born before 22 weeks are thriving. World's smallest baby is born in San Diego. And this one just came out a year ago or two in Singapore that the baby weighed 212 grams and they're leaving the hospital. So these are real issues that we as neonatologists and physicians in general are facing when parents come in in preterm labor. So our general outline today is really to look at the history and outcome of LGANs. Specifically, this, these are extremely low gestational age newborns. The current literature what are we doing here at Cedars Sinai and Greater California? And then move into the considerations of family counseling and how do we approach periviability at Cedars Sinai? And so we'll start with history. And um, our goals are really to just create uniformity in how we approach periviability and to standardize the pathway to consultations. 
So to start this conversation, we really have to ask ourselves what peri viability is. If you're like me, you might think of some of these words. It's confusing, it's uncertain, it's frustrating. There's inconsistency among providers. And my least favorite word, the dreaded gray zone. Um, but objectively, ACOG really defines peri viability as 20 and zero to 25 and six, seven weeks. Whereas the American Academy of Pediatrics, they sort of move to a 22 to 24 and six. And in general, we expect about 0.66% of births being extremely preterm. So it's a very rare occurrence, but when it occurs, it's important to know how to approach it. So it's always nice to look at how the landscape has evolved from a neonatology perspective. If we rewind to the 1940s, babies that are born extremely low birth weights or less than 1,000 grams, they died they did not have a good chance at surviving. But with technologic advances in medicine, moving into the 50s and 60s, you start seeing the survival increase to 10 to 30%. And into the 1970s, it now is starting to move closer to 40%. And then in the 80s and early 90s, we have this massive game changer, which is surfactant, and so now we're seeing babies born at 24 to 25 weeks gestation actually have survival rates of up to close to 60%. And now in where we're at the 2000s and beyond, these 23 weekers are now surviving close to 49%. And babies that are born um, beyond 25 weeks have a greater than 70% chance of survival. So we've really moved the needle. And if we look at the trends just on a bar graph, you can see from 1993 on the far left for each gestational age, 22 through 25 weeks, moving to 2015, you know, this, this bar graph really shows two primary things. 22 weeker survival has really been unchanged. Whereas the biggest change have been seen in the 23 to 24 week populations, and then the 25 weekers have really done fairly well throughout this epoch. But there's so much more than just the United States. And if you look at the global picture, there's just tremendous variability in how these babies do. And so much of it is likely due to just technologic advances and how developed these countries are. If you look at the 22 weekers, you know, Japan is really leading the way with close to a 37% uh, percent survival for 22 weekers um, and they really lead the pack throughout all these periviable gestations. But as we all know, there's so much more to outcomes than just survivability. So specifically for periviable newborns, we have very common comorbidities that we encounter in the NICU. The brain is one of the biggest ones. We deal with things such as intraventricular hemorrhage or periventricular leukomalacia, very significant cerebral injuries. They have issues with their eyes, something called retinopathy of prematurity. One of the worst comorbidities is chronic lung disease, also known as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. They're very prone to infections, both early onset and late onset sepsis. They're at risk for bowel perforations, both in the stomach and the intestines. They have the complication of a patent ductus arteriosus, which requires either medical therapy or even more invasive procedures to correct. And another sort of worst case scenario is necrotizing enterocolitis. And importantly, comorbidities also affect how the baby does in the future regarding development. Now, in general, national trends in survival have improved and also short outcomes of comorbidities have improved. So this repeated retrospective cross-sectional study was published in June 2022, and it's shown over a 10 year period, the last decade, that the rate of survival to discharge has considerably improved. And importantly, the improvement is most pronounced in infants born at 22 and 23 weeks gestation. So here you can see death or BPD has declined somewhat. Need for VP shunts because of severe hemorrhages has declined. 
severe necrotizing enterocolitis has declined and rates of PDA ligation have declined. Similarly, visual outcomes have improved with less babies having severe retinopathy of prematurity that would warrant laser therapy. Need for tracheostomies has declined. G-tubes fairly stagnant, but there's a slight downward trend and the um, severe neurologic injury has declined. And if we look at California specifically and broaden sort of the gestational age um, a little more, you can actually see that this study that evaluated over 49,000 babies that were born between 22 to 29 weeks or between a birth weight of 401 grams to 1500 grams between 2008 and 2017, um, they showed improvements in overall major morbidities. And again, these major morbidities are those, the necrotizing enterocolitis, the IVH, the retinopathy of prematurity. And importantly, the largest improvements in these comorbidities was seen in the babies born before 25 weeks gestation, with about a 19% reduction in those comorbidities. And more specifically, the largest improvements were seen in neck reduction as well as neonatal infection. Unfortunately, the study did show that the rates of chronic lung disease remained stagnant in the periviable group. But in addition to comorbidities and the challenges they bring, we also have to think about the utilization of resources and the overall economic impact. So it is challenging to overlook that economic impact be because we know that these babies require a lot of resources. So this table shows us a national perspective on the financial burden between 2007 and 2018. In general, NICU care is deemed to be cost effective because of the future anticipated contributions to society. But periviability really remains uncharted territory because we really don't know if the life years that these babies may attain positively contribute to societal needs. So as you can see here, the median costs incurred by a baby born before 24 weeks gestational age is approximately $930,000 with an anticipated length of stay in the hospital of 118 days. Now these numbers are slightly improved in preterm infants that are born at 24 weeks and beyond, but still fair, fairly staggering. Now, we can talk and talk about survival and show that outcomes are generally improving. We can maybe say the same thing about comorbidities, but you still can't really make informed decisions about these periviable babies without asking, how do the neurodevelopmental outcomes compare? And what progress, if any, have we made? So in 2017, this landmark trial by Young et al. reviewed outcomes of those babies born between 22 and 24 weeks gestation among three epochs um, between 2000 and 2011. And this took place at 11 neonatal research network centers and evaluated um, about 4,000 infants. And this study really helped guide a lot of the current guidelines that the field pursues. Infants were considered to have neurodevelopmental impairment if they had at least one of the following. Moderate or severe cerebral palsy, a gross motor functional classification system of at least two, and this is on a scale of five, with five being very impaired, needing full motor assistance, such as in a wheelchair, and one, in, one being no deficit and two being mild deficits. Profound hearing loss, profound visual impairment, or a cognitive impairment, which was two deviations below the mean. And this study really showed that infants born at 22 weeks between 2000 and 2011, they had a very low chance of survival without neurodevelopmental impairment. So there is no change or improvement. But what they did highlight is babies born during these three epochs at 23 weeks gestational age actually had a statistically significant improvement in the chance of survival without neurodevelopmental impairment. Similarly, those babies born at 24 weeks gestational age between 2000 and 2011 
had a statistically significant improvement in the chance of survival without impairments and an overall significant decrease in mortality. And so this was really encouraging and provided information to neonatology on we are sort of moving or advocating more for 24 weekers or resuscitation. But in addition to observing how these periviable newborns fare, we've also observed that there is so much more than just the gestational age. This study from 2008 prospectively studied a cohort of over 4,000 infants born between 22 and 25 weeks gestation and less than 1,000 grams. And they showed that increased weight, female sex, antenatal steroid administration, and singleton gestation were factors that significantly improved the outcomes in these periviable babies equivalent to a one week gain in gestational age when evaluated at 18 to 22 months. And we will talk more about this later. Similarly, this 2018 multi-center Vermont Oxford Network study, they wanted to, they wanted to assess the survival to hospital discharge, major morbidities among survivors, and the composite of survival to discharge without major morbidities in 22 to 25 week gestational age infants. And over 29,000 infants were included in the study, and they all received postnatal life support. Importantly, this table shows that the babies who received antenatal steroid administration or exposure had improved postnatal outcomes, with the babies born at 22 and 23 weeks gestation having an almost 20% improvement in their um, outcome of survival and survival without major morbidity. However, our challenges with really understanding the future outcomes of periviable newborns stems from this wide variability in the approach to resuscitation. Specifically, this study through the Neonatal Research Network looked at 24 hospitals with about 5,000 infants evaluated. And what we can see is that the hospital rates of active treatment, active meaning antenatal steroids and full postnatal life support, at 22, 23, and 24 weeks gestational age have extremely wide variability with hospital rates of active treatment of children born at 22 to 23 weeks gestation, accounting for the majority of between hospital variation in outcomes. This accounts for a 78% variation in survival, a 75% of variation in survival without impairment, uh, severe impairment, and a 41% variation in survival without moderate or severe impairment. But what's really interesting and fascinating about this study and this graph specifically is that among infants born at 22 to 23 weeks of gestation, the overall rates of active treatment were actually higher among infants born on the last two days of the gestational week than among those born earlier during the same week. So if you remember my case at the beginning, that baby that was at 22 and five was offered full resuscitation, whereas when they were at 22 and zero or 22 and one, they weren't. So all this information that I've really highlighted in the last 20 minutes is what led us to this 2014 executive summary that was um, developed between MFM, obstetricians, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it really recommended no resuscitation at 22 weeks gestation and to defer antenatal steroids until 23 weeks gestation. However, then ACOG, I think, um, said, well, you can consider resuscitation before 23 weeks, but we still don't recommend steroids until 23 weeks. So in general, we've seen an overall evolution in ACOG's recommendations with keeping antenatal steroids at a consideration when the mom is at 23 and zero and a recommendation when the mom is at 24 and beyond. But in 2021, Dr. Bacchus et al. 
did a systematic review and meta-analysis. And what they found is that there is this growing body of evidence that maybe, maybe the outcomes at 22 and 23 weeks might be acceptable. And these studies, this literature also supports that the antenatal steroid administration seems to improve these outcomes in these 22 and 23 weekers. So maybe we should consider antenatal steroids beginning at 22 and zero to 22 and six. And so this was recently released and reaffirmed back in 2021 and 2022 that ACOG is now displaying a consideration for antenatal steroids. However, it's important to note that this is still based on low quality evidence due to the large discrepancy in how these studies are performed and the overall sample sizes. So now that we've really covered some of the history and context of where we're at, there have really been two recent studies that also help shine a light on what these outcomes look like. Specifically, Iowa released this study in 2019, and they looked at outcomes born between the outcomes of babies born between 22 and 25 weeks gestation. And I should mention that all these babies received active treatment, meaning the obstetricians and MFM provided antenatal steroids and the neonatology group provided full postnatal life support. It was a retrospective cohort analysis between 2006 and 2015. They had about 70 babies born between 22 and 23 weeks gestation and about 178 babies born at 24 to 25 weeks, and they looked at the neurodevelopmental impairment at 18 to 22 months. What they found was that babies born between 22 and 23 weeks gestational age actually had similar cognitive scores to those babies born at 24 to 25 weeks gestational age, and this was in the range of unimpaired or mild impairment. The survivability of 22 to 23 weekers was lower, 78%, as compared to 24 to 25 week gestational age newborns who had a survivability of 89%. And moderate and severe neurodevelopmental impairment was similar between the 22 to 23 week group and the 24 to 25 week group. As a side note, I think it is important to mention that the babies born at 22 to 23 weeks of gestation did have a longer duration of mechanical ventilation, and they had higher rates of needing surgical ligation of a PDA, and had higher rates of surgical necrotizing enterocolitis and spontaneous intestinal perforations. Now, when this study came out, it was very exciting for the field of neonatology, but you know, it's appropriate to keep a cautious optimism due to the limitations of the study. It's a single institution. They only accounted for inborn infants. They had a very small sample size relative to larger studies. They did lack complete data, and it's really not the best generalizability. The population at Iowa is a predominantly white population that has exceptionally good prenatal care. Even more recently, this article was just published in 2022 and takes a more comprehensive look at how the United States has really been doing between 2013 to 2018 among 19 academic centers that also participate in the neonatal research network. They looked at over 10,000 infants born between 22 and 28 weeks gestational age, and they wanted to do follow-up assessments at 22 to 26 months corrected age. What they saw was that survival among 22 week gestational gestation newborns was 30% if active treatment was provided. So again, antenatal steroids and full postnatal life support and survival was about 56% for babies born at 23 weeks gestation. Importantly, that moderate or severe neurodevelopmental impairments, again, severe cognitive impairments, visual deficits, severe hearing loss, ranged from 55% at 22 weekers and decreased to 49% at 25 weeks. 
And so what we decided to do is compile the three most articles and put them in this table really for reference, especially as we continue to build our approach to consultations. And starting on the right, you have the Young et al. article from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017 and move to the left with the most current information. I would say we could probably block out this middle section from Iowa since it does seem to be um, very out of left field in terms of its numbers. But I, I do like to compare how the Young et al. article shows 22 weekers had a overall survival of 3% which has now increased to 30% on a national scale, and 24 weekers have risen from 56% to about 71%. So how are we doing at Cedar sinai We collected information about Cedar sinai experience with peri-viable newborns, and we compared it to the CPQCC, which is a quality committee in California that looks at all the NICUs out here. So this bar graph specifically shows the percentage of not providing delivery room resuscitation and Cedars is on the, the left in red. Um, out of 62 babies born before 20, basically 22 and 6, 85% um, were not resuscitated. So that seems to be in line with the greater national average. Um, 23 weekers, about 51% were not resuscitated. But then when we get to 24 and 25 weekers, you can see that the vast majority are offered resuscitation. And only three in the 24 weekers wasn't resuscitated and about four in the 25 week group. And then this line graph really shows that sort of de-escalation or the decreased resuscitation um, of 23 weekers, as in we are resuscitating these babies more often, moving to 2021. Then we want to look at the death before discharge. Now, I would caution us to look at this 22 week population. The N is exceptionally small, so I don't think that we are actually doing that well. Um, so this is also an outlier that um, doesn't account for possible transfer outs either. But if you look at the 23, 24 and 25 week populations, I think we have a general idea of how we're doing. So 23 weekers, um, 31% died before discharge. 24 weekers, about 35% died before discharge and 25 weekers, 15% died before discharge. And if you look at this in the scope of 2004 to 2021, you can see these general trend in improved survival outcomes in the 23, 24, and 25 week gestations. Now, what I don't have and what I I uh, hope to get in the near future is the neurodevelopmental outcomes for these babies, both at Cedar sinai and California. But this article literally, literally just came out this, this week and summarizes the California experience that over 16,000 babies that were born extremely preterm were included in this review between 2011 and 2019 and just reinforces that in California, active resuscitation increased among 22 to 24 week gestational age newborns. So again, looking at the 22 and 23 week populations, in 2011 to 2014, resuscitation was only attempted about 13% for 22 weekers and about 64% for 23 weekers. But between 2015 to 2019, that number has gone up nearly doubled for 22 weekers to 20% and has increased to over 70% for the 23 week population with a statistically significant outcome. And similarly, the survival to hospital discharge, it's still not fantastic. It's actually taken a dip most recently for the 22 weekers. It actually went down from 40% to 29%. Um, but for the 23 weekers, it's, it's uh, remained mostly stable. And then if we look at how the 24 week and 25 week populations compare, it really does seem 
um, to be stable. So resuscitation attempted between the two epochs has been mostly similar for, for both as well as survival. So now we're going to segue. And we're going to talk about family counseling. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to spend the last few minutes that we have here discussing considerations regarding family counseling um, in this area. So you guys just um, we spent about 30 minutes hearing a lot of data on the outcomes um, uh, from Dr. Langston and the current literature on this topic. And so what now, right? What do we do with this information and this data and how do we use it to help guide our families? in providing recommendations when it comes to resuscitation between 22 through 25 weeks. This is an extremely challenging topic um, for a number of reasons, one of which uh, may be that this is a emotionally charged topic for, for a lot of people, right? We may disagree um, on this area in this area. Um, there are physicians that may be concerned about the legal ramifications. And although uh, we heard all this data uh, by Dr. Langston, the truth is the data is not very robust um, as compared to other um, fields in medicine and uh, perhaps one of the reasons that is is because it is not that common right the uh, data that dr langston presented in regards to the cedar sinai experience that was a total of 69 babies between the years of 2004 through 2021 which is an average of four per year uh, far less than 1% of the deliveries that we see here at Cedar sinai So again, what do we do with this information? And um, are there national guidelines that help guide us as physicians um, on how to uh, provide recommendations to families? Um, this here is from a 2015 systematic review that looked at 31 national and international guidelines um, on this topic alone and what I've done is taken four of the institutions that I think are most relevant to us today and put them on the table here. As you can imagine, uh, the recommendations um, are highly variable. Uh, about two thirds of the 31 total guidelines reviewed here recommended comfort care at 22 weeks gestation. About two thirds recommend active care at 25 weeks gestation and sort of all over the place in between. You can see that the AP and ACOG are in line with each other and in recommending individualized care uh, um, as early as 22 weeks all the way through 25 weeks. The AHA and joint workshop um, I recommend comfort care at 22 weeks, active care at 25 weeks, and a mix of uh, individualized parental wishes in between. The last statement by the AP in 2015 on this topic um, states decision making in the delivery room should be individualized and family centered for births at 22 to 24 weeks. They have now removed the 25 weekers from this um, and uh, they state that we should take into account known fetal maternal conditions and parental beliefs. So um, if you're like me, you'll sort of look at this and be like, OK, well, but um, uh, still, I'm, you know, it's, it's not very clear, right? It's not very black or white in terms of what we should do. And again, why um, one of the reasons why this is known as the gray zone. Back in 2014, there was a joint workshop and Dr. Langston um, referenced this as well. Um, this was a joint workshop by the AP, ACOG, uh, the Society for MFM, as well as NICHD, and they put together this excellent read. It's a pair viable birth executive summary. And within that summary are considerations regarding family counseling. And I just want to zoom into a few areas of that uh, table um, and point out a few key um, issues. They state that counseling should be personalized and in the best interest of the family, considering aspects beyond gestational age. So I'm going to come back to that um, to that idea of beyond gestational age um, in a minute here. They suggest that written guidelines should be developed by the OB and neonatal teams with input from other stakeholders. They state that the institution should develop structured checklists and documentation to standardize the use of counseling and interventions, including newborn resuscitation. So what this is telling us is that best practices does involve um, clear statements and guidelines on this topic such that um, the counseling or the interventions that we provide a family um, uh, on a Tuesday is not uh, different from um, what provider may be present there um, counseling this family on a Friday. 
Prior to and after counseling sessions, the OB and NICU teams should confer to avoid conflicting information. They should be meeting uh, the parents together at the bedside if feasible, which um, studies suggest happens um, uh, far less than 50% at the time. And I would think, actually, I would argue even less um, here due to our large clinical responsibilities. Um, post counseling debriefing should occur. In general, what this is telling us is that the OB and the NICU teams should be in constant and direct communication with each other before, during, and after, as it's extremely important that we are providing consistent information and recommendation to these families. Um, we should be fostering informed, collaborative decision making in an open, transparent, and supportive atmosphere. The information needs to be individualized based on the family's preferences, wants, and needs. And we need to recognize that family wishes may be influenced by their cultural background, religion, or both. So let's come back to that idea of, of uh, thinking about aspects outside of gestational age. You see a lot of the literature that was just provided and a lot of the outcomes data is provided in terms of gestational age. And you know that does simplify the matter and it's and it's and it's easier to present the data that way but when counseling these families it's important that we think of other um, aspects as well we know that the fetus is in a uh, rapidly in a rapid stage of development between 22 through 25 weeks such that theoretically each additional day could affect the outcomes um, of that baby. We also know that there's inaccuracy to gestational age dating, right? Outside of IVF, the gold standard can be off by a few days to a couple of weeks, depending when the dating is done. This is actually very well demonstrated um, on the NICHD birth outcomes tool. If you've ever used this tool, it will ask you to input five different characteristics, one of which is the estimated gestational age. Another is the estimated fetal weight, which again is an estimate. It can be off by 15 to 20 percent of the actual weight, such that an EFW of 500 could be um, uh, less than 400 or it could be greater than 600 grams. And that's important because each um, 100 gram increment of weight gain affords an additional week in terms of survivability data for that neonate. In addition, female gender has a one week advantage over a male gender. A singleton has a one week advantage over multiples and any receipt of antenatal steroids has a one week advantage over no receipt um, of antenatal steroids. So again, if you go on the website, this is what it looks like. You input those five um, uh, pieces of information and it provides you this table. It will provide percentages percentage ranges um, in terms of survivability with active treatment, without active treatment, and outcomes at 18 to 26 months. So if we were to actually input the data for a 22-week, 500-gram singleton, uh, singleton female that received steroids, it would be exactly equivalent to the outcomes of a 24-week, 400-gram male who was a singleton who received antenatal steroids. So again, um, this shows you that looking at gestational age alone um, is, is inappropriate. And of course, there is a number of other factors to consider. Birth location, maternal age, pregnancy complications, health, is there chorioamnionitis? Is there preeclampsia? Are there other complications? Certainly socioeconomic factors and genetics play a role and a number of other obstetric interventions of which we don't have time to get into today. But the point is that decisions regarding resuscitation should not be made on the basis of gestational age alone. So this is a study that I like to share um, because it's actually a reminder to myself that as practitioners, we often tend to overestimate mortality and morbidity. This is a 2000 um, uh, cross-sectional survey uh, that was published in pediatrics. And what they did is they surveyed about 750 of, um, OBs and pediatricians, including neonatologists, and asked them what do they think is the percent survival and the percent handicap free survival of neonates between 23 weeks to 36 weeks gestational age. They then compared the uh, responses to actual outcomes data using NICHD and March of Dimes. And um, you can see the top line here. Oops. Get my pointer. Um, you can see the top line here is um, what the actual outcomes data was and well beneath that was the pediatricians responses and below that was the OB's responses in terms of percent survival. 
and this uh, stood true all the way from 23 weeks through um, 36 weeks, but most pronounced below 28 weeks. And then in terms of handicap free survival, which was defined as no cerebral palsy, no IQ less than 70, no blindness, no deafness, no failure to thrive. You can see that the OB and um, pediatrician responses were in line with each other well below that of the actual data, um, suggesting that both uh, OBs and pediatricians uh, underestimate their survival rates and freedom from serious handicap um, really at all gestational ages. Um, similarly, uh, sometimes I think that we tend to overestimate the burden, or at least I do, the burden that these families um, have to carry. Um, but, but surveys of ELBW survivors and their parents suggest that they have decent quality of life. So we spent um, about 30 minutes listening to, to numbers, right? To statistics, to outcomes, and uh, policy statements really uh, suggest that parents should be provided the most accurate prognosis. But the empiric research on how to communicate this data is lacking. A lot of times we go into these counseling sessions with our NICHD tool, right, numbers in hand ready to tell parents these numbers but what is the problem with um, with doing that well parents often don't understand statistics or they don't think that it is um, relevant to their specific situation um, they're under extremely stressful circumstances uh, an extremely stress stressful situation and may not actually remember the numbers that we um, that we provide them we know statistics don't account for a multitude of other factors involved and the way that you present the numbers can also affect parents decision making positive framing versus neg negative framing so stating 80 percent survival instead of 20 percent mortality can actually um, impact the parents decision making so I think it is actually more important to focus on imprecise yet meaningful statements to these families when we counsel them rather than specific numbers so what do parents find important in their decision making? This was a, um, a study where they uh, surveyed moms who lost um, newborns due to either a known lethal congenital anomaly or extreme prematurity and sort of surveyed them about what values were important in their decision making process. Um, they stated things like religion, spirituality, hope, compassion were um, the most important things rather than morbidity and mortality data. They all wanted to participate in decision making regarding delivery room resuscitation, and um, they wanted and trusted compassionate physicians. Um, they uh, uh, sort of were let down by physicians who were acting by the book. Really, uh, in conclusion, they often were not affected by predictions of morbidity and mortality, but rather by their own sense of the possibility of survival, which seemed to be um, far better than ours. OK, so I don't have um, time to go through this in detail, but there are three general models of consultation. The first is known as the neutral information model. This is that purely informative approach, right? This is the doctor who goes in and just provides all of the data and all of the information and all of the numbers. But the responsibility in the decision making is completely left to the parents, which, as you can imagine, can leave an unfair sort of um, place an unfair burden on these families. Then there's um, the ascent model, which is um, essentially the, uh, the opposite. This is where you go in with your clear preferences and you uh, use data to justify those preferences and the parents are essentially left with a proposition to consider. And we all know that the shared decision making model is um, what we should be following here. Uh, which essentially is where you try to understand the patient's values, their expectations, and together come to a solution that best fits that family's needs and recognize that that may be different family to family. Interestingly, actually studies suggest that um, uh, trainees and early career physicians follow the neutral information model. With a few years of experience, uh, they tend to move towards the ascent model. And with an average of 10 years of experience or more, physicians uh, follow the shared decision making model approach. So a lot of the information that I just provided was very well summarized in the 2015 uh, statement by the AAP uh, regarding um, uh, counseling before 25 weeks. And again, some of the takeaway points, um, counseling should be family centered. Uh, these needs to be joint discussions. We need to support the parents in their cultural, religious, and spiritual needs. 
And importantly, we need to make a plan before going into the delivery room um, and avoid statements such as, well, let's just see how your baby looks in the delivery room and make a decision then. And why is that? This is known as the wait and see method, and we know that in ELBW infants, this is completely unreliable. APGAR scores are not predictive of survival with a neurological abnormality, intact neurological survival, or death before discharge in ELBW infants. We know that Ballard estimates can be off by a month, so if ever the gestational age is in question, it is inappropriate to um, date that baby after birth and try to figure out a plan then. Studies suggest that we have a poor ability to predict survival and our clinical intuition is often unreliable as well. There was actually this interesting study that showed real ELBW uh, resuscitation videos to neonatology attendings as well as fellows, and at three different time points during the resuscitation, asked them, do you think this infant will survive to discharge? And it turns out we were correct only half of the time, um, no better than a coin toss. Um, another study looked at intubated ELBW infants um, in one NICU over the course of five years, and for every day that that infant was mechanically ventilated, asked the NICU providers, do you think this baby will survive to discharge? And only one third of the um, uh, infants that were predicted to die actually died before discharge, which again points to the fact that we tend to overestimate morbidity and mortality. So really, in conclusion, decisions regarding resuscitation should be communicated um, before birth. So where does that leave us here at Cedars-Sinai uh, moving forward? Uh, you've heard policy statements suggest that we need to uh, have written guidelines and statements regarding the treatment, evaluation, and management of these fetuses and newborns with a goal really to provide consistent and evidence-based care and communication as best as possible to these families while still um, allowing flexibility and individualized care on a case-by-case -case basis. We want to include a multitude of stakeholders um, that you see listed here. Currently, what we've done is had a round roundtable discussion with the NICU and MFM team, and what we'd like to do moving forward is create this written guideline um, with really clear uh, flowchart with best practices involving all the stakeholders uh, that I've listed here. And once the final uh, once the final guideline and statement is complete, um, we can uh, place it somewhere such as Box or elsewhere with ease, ease, uh, easy accessibility for everybody. Um, and again, this isn't meant to be, you know, a policy statement or a, um, a protocol, just a guideline. Uh, and there is no way that we can come up with a statement where everybody agrees with 100% of the things listed on the statement. But I think we can do a good job of helping guide, um, guide uh, everybody here involved and provide more consistent care to these families and really prioritize the counseling for these families um, as they come in. So a very uh, sort of simplified summary and conclusion of a complex topic, survivability of these neonates has improved, intact survival has improved, shared decision making and individualized care is necessary, and guidelines are needed to improve consistency in this area. These are our references, and with that being said, um, again, I'd like to uh, thank you all for giving us the opportunity to speak about this important topic and um, we're happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Okay, so one question in the chat, does the metric death prior to discharge reflect only death due to medical reasons versus parent decision to withdraw care? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes. The studies only look at the babies that died for medical reasons. Thank you for that suggestion. It will involve family planning as well. Any other questions or thoughts? Let me just, do we have any, I don't see any other questions in the chat.
Well, I think if there are no other questions, then um, thank you guys very much, and we'll all gain a few extra minutes to the day. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.